is July the 12th, 2020. Joshua and Daniel Pryor give a team teaching on Hebrews chapter 6. It's great to see all you smiling faces. Yes, a bunch of people are not here on this beautiful hot Sunday, but we are here. Again, those online, please tell us you're here on the chat box so we can acknowledge you at the end of the service and Yay. bless you. Amen. Yay. Let us yeah. know. Don't be shy. We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 6 tonight. So we took a week break last week when Josh spoke on weakness. And we're going to jump in. You know, any of y'all remember some points from Hebrews 1 through 5? Rest. Sonship. Sonship. Weakness. Jesus the high priest. Train your senses. Get to know God in experience. These are the ideas from Hebrews 1 through 5. So we're going to do Hebrews chapter 6. And chapter 6 is a... Don said it can be a difficult chapter, but we're going to try to really give the big picture of chapter six. We'll hit some things specifically in chapter six, but we're not going to try to get into the minutia, the, the minute details of chapter six, because we really feel like God's saying big picture, vision, purpose, boom, huge weight, not little, little, little bitty. So we're going to begin Chapter 6, verse 1, and I'll read, bro. Yeah, just go ahead to verse 8. Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works, of faith toward God, instructions about baptisms, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. For in this case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift, have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, have tasted the good word of God and the powers of an age to come, and have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance, since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. For ground that drinks the rain which often falls on it and brings forth vegetation useful to those for whose sake it is also tilled, receives a blessing from God. But if it yields thorns and thistles, it is worthless and close to being cursed and it ends up being burned. So these motifs or themes leading up to understanding chapter 6 is very important because a lot of us, well, a large part of Christianity likes to jump into chapter 6 and really do strong judgment. But if you understand the idea of Hebrews, the idea of sonship, of the entering into the resurrected Melchizedek body of Christ through weakness, through the high priest. So when you read this very, 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 very serious remark, you got to understand that it's not related to just this general idea of salvation. Brother Daniel? Yeah, so that's really important because if you think about everything he said up to this point, chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, he said all that he's, he's gone through all these incredible things, right? Sonship, resurrection, hearing God's voice, hearing him speak, entering the land of rest. Then he talks about man, how man is so important. Jesus is the man. Jesus is, we're starting to see how Jesus fulfilled this role as man. He became the high priest. And in chapter five, we talked about it got brought to this point of culmination. And this point of culmination was glorification, sonship, resurrection, and the order of Melchizedek all being brought together. Now, when this was originally written, there was no chapter 5, chapter 6. This was just a letter to the Hebrews. 
okay? And so there wasn't a formal break in what's being said. And at the end of chapter five, remember, he's, he kind of rebuked him pretty strongly. He said, you guys should be teachers by now. But because you're not accustomed to the word of righteousness and you haven't practiced and trained your senses, you're still in need of milk instead of solid food. And he jumps into chapter six and he's going to hit again right in the mouth this idea of being in an infant place, in an elementary place, in a place where you really should have progressed from. And the reason he does it is because he is wanting and desiring to share incredible reality of Christ according to the order of Melchizedek. But there is a reality in life in how God has created us and how God operates is that you do not hand someone who is a baby, someone who has made a choice to stay in elementary school, a calculus problem. You do not hand them the keys to dangerous chemicals. You do not hand them the keys to more advanced levels of reality. And so when you come into chapter six, he's still going to be hitting this point of the elementary things that Joshua was going to get into. But I want to make this point is it says, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ. This is one of the key indicators of someone who is mature. Their entire Christian life is about the Christ. Now the Christ here doesn't mention Jesus. And that word there is Messiah. In these infantile elementary believers are people who their entire focus is on this messiah christ figure who's going to come and they live their life in this idea of everything is out there and it's going to come it's all about christ but the whole message of revelate of hebrews and what he's been saying is no, jesus came into humanity jesus became a part of of mankind. He became one of the brethren. And so immaturity is to look at Christ and to look at the things of God as just out there. Oh, it's going to happen. Oh, it's going to come one day. Oh, there's a Messiah out there where something is real. But maturity is to say in today, in this moment, what is the tangible reality of Jesus Christ, the man and God in one in front of me right now. So these believers are continuing to get rebuked, even though it's not them. The writer of Hebrews is calling out these immature people, and he's saying, look, why are you still needing the elementary teachings about the Christ? As if Christ is not with you. As if Jesus is not with you as a believer. They still have this perspective of it's out there. It's going to come one day. It's going to be something that's going to happen. But it has nothing to do with the tangible reality of what am I being responsible for as a person in myself. And so it's always about the Christ. And you'll see people run around their whole life. Their whole identity is always about something that God's going to do. It's always about something that God is said. It's always about something out there. It's never, this is God right here. God is with me right here. I don't have anything else for you, but God's with me right here. That's maturity. It's to walk in a consciousness of God is with me right here. It's not just a Messiah that's going to come to me and I can sit here in my pity. It's the reality of Jesus Christ is right here, having relationship with me right now. So the, the author is going to lay into some of these elementary teachings that really we should be beyond and are important, but only important to a certain point. They're not going to get you into the calculus. They're going to keep you on basic addition. You want to talk about those things, bro? Yeah, that was a pretty big bomb. I didn't know he was going to say that, but that was pretty good. Uh, so he says, let us press on to maturity. So you have this idea of taking steps, of moving forward. Of course, it's in this rest. It's in this reality. But the next, the first two, there's six of them here. And he says, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and a faith toward God. These really work together. You know the Christians all the time. I repent of this. I repent of that. I repent of this. They've been repenting for 50 years, repenting for 10 years. 
Just go ahead and repent and turn back into God. Realize your oneness. The second part is enabled by the first part. And it's really to come to the revelation to fling yourself upon God. So the word toward is really, I like the word of upon. It gives the idea of Jesus says, come to me all who are heavy laden and I will give you rest. You're dropping what you have and you're yoking yourself into Christ. You're realizing this identity of oneness. This is this idea. God is the burden bearer. God is the one who's going to do it. You're sitting there saying, amen, I'm not going to move outside of the life of God because everything outside of the life of God is dead. It doesn't have life. It doesn't have the life of a spirit. It doesn't have the life of the father. It doesn't have the life of the son. How many times this week you do something and it's not life because you think it's a good idea or because you're emotional or because it's logical. You're not relying on the life of God. And there's rest in the life of God because he's taking the burden on. It's him doing it. Even today, I think it's freaking hilarious. It is so freaking hilarious, this message we're talking about in the refuge in chapter 6. And half of our people don't show up. I've just got, caught myself laughing because it's forcing me to look inside of my own heart and saying, Joshua, are you looking at the people or are you looking at me? Again, that idea is there. It's piercing my heart. And God is just laughing because he's saying, are you really upon me? Your whole entire being, is it resting upon me? Then the next ones are instruction about baptisms and the laying on of hands. Instructions about baptism in short, there are many baptisms, but they're separations and putting on. Whether you're baptized with water is a separation, whether you're putting on a baptism of the Holy Spirit. Simple, there's a lot more in detail, but that's not our point. The laying on of hands, community, resurrection life, also hands... Um, also tell of destiny of life story when Paul lays his hands on Timothy he's giving a part of his destiny he's unlocking it the next one is the resurrection the dead and eternal judgment this is another these are basic things that as a maturing Christian you got to realize the end is never death the end is resurrection this has to be your understanding as you walk out into the world as you live your life in your family in relationships the end is resurrection life the end is not death the end is resurrection life resurrection from the dead is what I know and live and breathe and then it ends with eternal judgment uh, basically that J Jesus says if you believe in me uh you will not receive judgment, but if you don't believe, you have been judged already. And so this idea of judgment is that in Christ, everything's been judged. It's already been done. His blood, his body has been spilt. That is the final straw. That is the final thing. It's do you want to step into him or do you want to keep doing whatever you want to do? This idea of eternal judgment. And you're no longer judging yourself according to the world standards, according to the fleshly standards according to any lesser standard, you're allowing God, who is eternity himself, to judge you. These are these basic ideas. I don't want to get into them too much because it's too much, but they're just laid out there. Basic. Verse 3, and this we will do if God permits. God is wanting to be grown up about this. And he's going to say, you're going to have to grow up for you to come past these basic things. If you don't realize that I end up in resurrection life, if you don't realize what I'm saying is true, that I am enough, that my body and blood's enough, if you don't realize that I can bring you through to the other side, I can bring you into the promise. If you don't realize that you can't do it, if you don't realize the idea of community, if you don't realize these ideas of separating from the things of the world and putting on the things of God and these things, God is not going to allow you to be mature, to start growing up into maturity. Because if you do and you fall away, then you're going to be burned. This isn't the idea of just you're going to hell for eternity. This is the idea is a basic forestry, basic field understanding when the field grows over when the forest it's good for it to be burned down because it's not producing it can't have the flow of oxygen and nutrients and everything's it needs this is the same thing is true when you start growing up as a fig tree but you're bearing forth thorn, thorns and thistles god because he loves you is going to discipline you he's going to say fire upon your life because he wants you 
to actually come to something that can produce something that is good and godly according to his image instead of something that is thorns and thistles. Yes, you partake in of these powers of the age to come. Yes, you're doing this. Yes, you're doing that. But he's very serious because he wants you to bring forth a blessing rather than a cursing. And if you're bringing forth thorns and thistles, everything apart from God, even if it looks good, God says, no, I'm going to burn up that wood hand stubble. I'm going to burn up the structure that you've built your life in so you can really bring something forth. And we're not going to delve into this idea uh, any more than that, I don't think, unless Dana wants to pop in and say something right there. But I just wanted to say that metaphorically, you are this tree, you are this fruit plant, and God is calling you to mature. And if you're bearing forth whatever, he's going to say, he says, it yields thorns and thistles that is worthless and close to being cursed. Doesn't mean it is going to be cursed, but it's close. And it ends up being burned because God is going to burn your stuff down so you don't fall into being cursed. God doesn't want you to be cursed as his child. And so he has to burn it down. He has to burn you down, this idea, these structures down to actually bring forth what he desires. I know it's very serious, but it's very true because God wants you to step into really knowing God, really knowing your true self, to focus on the Father rather than the focus on this false self, your hubris, your pride, your arrogance. He wants you to be manifestationally one with Him. Yeah. And if you can't do that, then He says, hey, I gotta, I gotta start again. Fire, start again. You need some more nutrients. You need some more whatever in your life. And the reality is, when you talk about a field being burned, a field is not destroyed when it's burned. It's replenished. So, once again, he's talking about maturity. He's talking about growing up. And we have this interlude for the babies, right? Where he's saying, look, you're still on milk. You still want elementary teachings. Yeah, even though you've tasted this, this, and this. He's not pointing to this reality of losing your salvation. When he says it's going to be burned, every man's work is going to be tested by fire. It's a reality. It's a reality we're going to face. It's a reality that you step into when you step into maturity. Even if you're a child and you have a child, guess what? You find out real quick that there's a level of maturity that you're now going to have to walk in. And everything you say or do is going to get tested because that little kid's probably going to turn around and say the same things you're saying. Right? I got upset with my mom one time because I said something she said. And she was like, no, you don't say that. You know? But that's the reality is that when things start to grow in your life, those things are going to bring about a testing. There's going to be a fire there. And if stuff gets burned down and destroyed, it doesn't mean the field is gone. The field represents your soil. It doesn't mean your soil is destroyed. What it means is that everything that was built upon that field or came out of that has been destroyed. And you can start over with freshness and newness. But you have to remember, this is a little interlude to the babies. This is a little inter to interlude to the people that he's kind of perturbed with and saying, look, I wanted to talk about great things, but now I'm having to jump in here and talk about milk and elementary things. And he says, the only way to go on is if God permits. When you think about in Hebrews, what has the author of Hebrews told us to do as believers? Has he ever told us to keep the law? No. Has he ever told us to be our own righteousness? No. Has he ever told us to go out and do this work and that work and this work and that work? No. The things he has said to us is pay attention, believe, and practice your senses. Those are, the, those are essentially the three things that the author has given to us to be doing. And in the process of doing those things, we step into maturity. Because when you're paying attention... You see more, you're aware of more, you start to understand and ask questions, right? When you're paying attention, you're hearing God's voice, then he calls you to believe. When you believe, you enter into that rest. You enter into the place where God's word is working in your life, but you're resting. And he says, practice your senses, not just little things about don't kill someone or don't have sex with that person, 
or don't look at this or don't lie, but practice your senses in those unseen realms. When you start to do that, you start to walk in a level of maturity. And so God permits us to go on. But one thing I want to point out is it says all of these people have tasted of the good word of God, right? And the powers of the age to come and the heavenly gift. They've been marked made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. Another point about an immature person is that they hang the Son of God on themselves. The immature person will hang them, hang the Son of God. We're talking about the Son of God, glorified, high priest, in the order of Melchizedek, resurrected from the dead, fullness of God, fullness of man. They'll take that reality and they'll hang it upon themselves. And everything will be a, come about them. Instead of it being about God and what he's done... And even when you parallel that back to what was the cross, what was the actual cross that Jesus hung on? Well, we know that it was a tree because it was wood. So it represented a tree and it says, curse is every man who hung on a tree. And the tree that got man in trouble in the beginning was what? The tree of knowledge of good and evil. And so Jesus, who was life, was hung upon that tree of knowledge of good and evil and redeemed man from that reality. But an infant, a baby, someone who is immature, will take the realities of God, the reality of the Son of God, and make it about themselves. If you're a mature person, you can recognize pretty quickly not everything is about you. (laughs) Usually you have very little to do with the reality of the world. You recognize how small you are in maturity, not how everything is hung upon you and your own thoughts and your own beliefs and your own ideas and your own ways. Everybody has seen an immature person, right? One of the most annoying things is that you can't get them to stop making everything about them, right? We've all experienced this. Hello, come on. You know what I'm talking about? You're talking to someone and you're trying to say something and no matter what you say, no matter what you do, it's always about them. And it's like, I'm trying to say something, doesn't have anything to do with that. Why are you talking about yourself? And you realize this person just doesn't have the ability to go on, to go beyond the idea that everything hangs on them. Everything is about them. And so when you're in that position, when you make everything about you, It's impossible to be in a place of repentance because repentance is the exact opposite of making it about you. Repentance is about turning from you toward God. So when you crucify the son of God to yourself, you make it about you. And when you make it about you, there's no place of repentance. So the field is not going to be destroyed. This is not about losing your salvation. But the author is saying strongly, come on guys, let's go on to maturity. We will do this if God permits. The way that God permits is by simply doing what we've already been talking about. Just be aware, believe in Jesus Christ, the high priest, and start to practice your senses. So now let's go on. Okay, because I have so much to say about Christ according to the order of Melchizedek. And even though I'm talking about things about salvation that I want to go beyond. I want you to understand there's so much more. You don't have to be immature. You don't have to make it just about yourself and about how Jesus is going to come save you. And it's going to be something out there one day. It's about maturity and growing up and going on. So let's go on. Well, I have one if thing. If you have something else, have go ahead. I just have one other thing. Sorry, bro. Go ahead. If you're stuck with these foundational things, set in your heart that you want to go on. But as you begin to practice your senses, you go back to these foundations and say, it is not of myself. It is of you. I'm separated from the world. I'm separated from friends, family, everything. I'm separated and I'm joined to you. I'm joined with this body. The end is resurrection life. You use these six things as your plumb lines, your directives as you engage spiritual matters, as you engage. Okay. So that's just real quick, but we'll go on. Verse nine, bro, you want to read or you want me to read? Sure. I can read. Okay. 
But beloved, here's another term that he calls you just to make a little note there. He called you holy brethren. Now he's calling you beloved. But beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you and things that accompany salvation, though we are speaking in this way. For God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown toward his name in having ministered and in still ministering to the saints. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you will not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you, I will surely multiply you. And so, having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. For men swear by one for men swear by one greater than themselves, and with them an oath is given, as confirmation is an end of every dispute. In the same way, God, desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise of the unchangeableness of his purpose, interposed with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, one which enters within the veil where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. See why this is such a hard chapter. That's a lot, right? That's a lot. That's a lot of stuff that we're not even going to get into that there's just so much there. But stay in the big picture and we're going to Tap some things out here, okay? Stay in the big picture focus. We're going on to maturity. We're not going to be immature. We're not going to be little babies because God is going to permit us to go on, right? So we're going on and we're the beloved and there's better things. I'll make this point in the hand to you, bro. There's better things concerning you and things that accompany salvation, though we are speaking in this way. God has so many better things for you. You have no idea. You have no idea the better things God has for you. Think about the Jewish people. The Jewish people had a system that was complete in totality by which they could be righteous. They had a complete system by which they could be righteous, they could be cleansed, and they could have relationship with God. That's incredible. Nowhere else on the earth, nowhere else throughout all of human history has there ever been a system like the Jewish reality and the system that they had. But the author here is going to say, look, even though you are Jews, even though you are Hebrews, there is better things. Even though God gave you the best that was amongst mankind when he gave you a shadow when he gave you a shadow of things, there's better, there's better, there's better, there's better things. So as we go forward in the book of Hebrews, we're going to be waiting and anticipating and stepping into maturity as we recognize there's better things than what's in our midst right now. Yeah, you have a good system, okay? You've survived for 40 years, but guess what? There's a lot better than what you've been doing. There's a lot more that God has for you. You receive that? You believe that? Yeah. You've made it 20 years, you've made it 30 years or 50 years, but God says, hey, how about eternity? Yeah. Step up your game, son. Step up your game. There's some better things. Go ahead. Oh, man, that was pretty good too. So uh, just in this verse 9, I want to point some things out. He says, though we are speaking in this way, he's speaking with truth and he's being very serious with the people here. But he begins with, but beloved. You know, it's interesting. I don't remember ever him calling them beloved up to this point or saying, I love you. But this is the reality of it, that if you've been walking and experiencing this, you're going to know how much God loves for you. And he's reminding you that, that God's basic idea of why he's doing all this is his great love. And this is why he wants you to go on to better things that accompany your salvation. I even think this is why God is shaking up this, this world is because he's saying, guys, there's so much better things that accompany your salvation. Why aren't you paying attention? Why aren't you maturing? 
Beloved, do you not know that you are more loved than the person who just struggles outside of me? I mean, I love the sparrow, but do you think you're more loved than the sparrow? This is this idea he, he's trying to beat into our hearts. He's trying to just pour and pour and pour and pour back into us. Do you not think of that value that's there? For God is not unjust to forget your work, your deeds, everything you've done. He knows it all. He's seen it all. And he's saying, guys, do you really know how much I love you? And he wants, and it's in verse 11, he says, and we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end. Again, you have this word of being diligent, of practice, of not being in the next verse sluggish in verse 12, so that you will not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. Daniel's going to say something on faith and patience here in a minute. But if you break down this word sluggish, it, the root word of it is a bastard, a false heir, someone who is not an heir. And you know, one of the most disappointing things and unenergizing things is when you feel left out. Think about it. When you're in school and you're the last one picked on the kickball team or you're the girl who doesn't be the cheerleader, or, you know, these ideas of being left out or you're the middle child and your dad is like, you go work out in the field, son, all day long. And the youngest one is like the, the spoiled rotten kid. And you're sitting there, you know, with your thumb in your mouth crying because it's so painful this idea is god is trying to separate us from the the word is nothros uh, i think it's how pronounced josh is greek studying greek you pronounce it better than that but this idea of god is wanting to you to realize your position of inheritance to realize who you really are as an heir of promise and be diligent in this through faith and patience faith and patience are a vessel of your inheritance. Go ahead, write that down. That's a good one. Faith and patience are a vessel of inheritance. If you want to inherit what God has for you, you will have to walk in the maturity of having faith and patience. God does a lot of bam things, but there's some real, real good things God does through patience and through faith. And a reality of maturity is having faith and patience, right? How many of us in our immaturity went out and said, I've got to have this right now, right? And we spent $500 or $50,000 on a new car or a whatever we had to have right now, right? Because of our immaturity, we didn't have the maturity to say, let me just be patient for one night or one day or one week. And say, let me see if this is really going to work out. Let me see if this is really going to play out. Faith and patience are a vessel of inheritance. And realize here, throughout the whole book of Hebrews, the author his, talks in plurality. Do you catch that? He says, for we, right? And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize realize the full assurance of hope so that you will not be sluggish but imitators of those who through faith and promise for when God made the promise etc 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 he goes on and he's talking about this hope we have there's a reality of plurality that we have in maturity when we start to walk in maturity we start to acknowledge greater reality the dynamic of we once again because it's not all about us right? You recognize that your, con your actions have consequences that don't just involve you. They have ramifications that don't just involve you. And so he says, we desire that you show diligence to realize the full assurance of hope until the end. First Timothy chapter one, verse one tells us that Christ Jesus is our hope. Once again, he's pointing to this reality of maturity and full assurance. He doesn't just want you to have half assurance or a part of assurance. He wants you to have a full assurance of Christ Jesus, who is your hope. And he says, show diligence, show the same diligence. It's just about being diligent. He doesn't say you have to figure it out. He just says, be diligent in paying attention. Be diligent in practice. Be diligent in believing. 
Because the high priest who has already done it is going to give you the answers. He's going to minister to you. He's going to show you the way. He's going to lead you. But that requires you to have faith and patience. Faith and patience. You know, I'll tell you a funny story just quickly. I have someone in my life who I love and care about. And they love and care about me. And they do not have a concept of waiting upon the Lord. And they would desire that I have all the answers for them right now. And they would desire that I do not need to wait upon the Lord to answer or to do something. I need to go out and do something in myself. And I love this person very much. But the reality is, is that in my life, if God is calling me to partake of the fullness of what he has for me, there's a reality where I'm going to have to be patient and wait upon him, right? I don't think there's any example in scripture, even Jesus Christ himself, who could be the best example, he didn't have an instantaneous reality of everything. He waited. He learned obedience. He suffered through things. He learned to be patient. And he had faith. Faith and patience are a vessel of our inheritance. Don't become discouraged because you're having to wait, because you're having to be patient for something. Recognize this is a part of your maturity because God's going to give you an inheritance in that maturity. Amen? I know it's hard to wait at times, but just be patient. Try to be patient. Train yourself in being patient. Even if you do something small and picking up your phone first thing in the morning tell yourself I'm going to wait five minutes to even look at that I'm going to wait five minutes I'm going to be patient the world's calling Facebook is texting me Twitter is tweeting me Instagram is snapping me whatever you do just tell yourself and start training practicing in little things I'm going to wait five minutes I'm going to be patient before I respond I'm going to be patient before I do something. Faith and patience is a vessel of inheritance. Do you want to say something? Yeah, I did. Uh, One thing about patience, this is an active patience. This isn't a passive patience. And what I mean by that is it's not like, hey, I'm waiting for my drug guy to get here. Let me sit here and watch TV. You know, you're filling it up with another addiction and waiting for your drug guy to get here. The same thing is with God. It's not, oh, God, I'm going to wait on you, but let me sit there and just stare at the TV or look at Facebook or Instagram for four hours or do this or do that. This is this idea of active patience. It's active. You're standing up the same way John the Baptist stood up and waited the, waited for the Lord. Uh, he, he stood up. He, he was active in his patience. This idea of patience is being active in it. You're looking, you're expecting. It doesn't mean you actually have to do that the hundred percent of the time, but if you're aware, you stand up periodically throughout your day and you metaphorically, well, really with your heart's eyes, you gaze into God, into who he is. God, I don't know what to expect, but you are my expectation. And what he'll begin to do is he'll start giving you promises. Now, he gave this promise to can Abraham. I, can I say something yeah, before you do that? A great example of patience in Abraham is the reality of Abraham was being patient when he was carrying and walking with Isaac up the mountain to make a sacrifice. God had called him to lay down his kid, right? He was walking up the mountain. He was going to make this sacrifice, but he was being patient for the Lord to provide the sacrifice, even though God had told him to sacrifice your child. He was being patient for the fullness of what God was going to do to come about, but he was still walking in obedience and what he had heard God say to do. He was walking in patience when he left the Ur of the Chaldees, not knowing where he was going. He was still going towards something based on faith. Faith is what he had heard God say, but he was being patient for the reality of the fullness to be made manifest. And so that's a great point on that active faith, active patience. It's not you sit there and say, God, I'm going to stay in the Ur of the Chaldees until you get me out of here. It's, okay, I'm going to get up and start leaving the Ur of the Chaldees and be patient 
for you to show me where the promised land is that what you're going to bring me into. So God gives Abraham this promise. I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply you. And he does this by himself. And it says, uh, in verse 15, and so having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. Abraham may get into that, maybe not. Verse 16, for men swear by one greater than themselves with them, an oath is given as a confirmation is the end of every dispute. In the same way, God desiring even more to show to the heirs, see the heirs of promise, the heirs of promise, See, being sluggish, the false heir, the bastard, to now being heirs to the promise, the unchangeableness of his purpose interposed with the oath so that two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope that is set before us. So what is this doing? What is this giving us? This refuge, what is a refuge? A place of security, a place of sustainment, a place of, of provision that God has provided. And so when God speaks to Abraham, hey, blessing I will multiply you, bless, you know, that whatever his promise was, whatever he just said. I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply you. This promise of Isaac, of the seed, which again is Christ, but we'll just say Isaac for right now. When God spoke this to him, he swore by himself, and Daniel's going to get into that. Well, you can just say it real quick, bro. Swearing by himself, there's no one greater than God. And when he swore by himself, he swore by his own nature, by his own identity, by who he was, and he gave his word. That's enough for God. But God even went beyond because of the reality of man, and he did something that man does. And what God did was he interposed it with an oath. And that oath is the spirit, right? Jesus is the word, is he not? Jesus is enough to solve the problem. But God, in his goodness and in his greatness and in his wisdom, he says, not only am I going to solve the problem, but I'm going to interpose it with an oath that will prove and bring about a surety in you of the reality of the fullness of the word that I've given to you. So that's what he does. He gives the word and he gives the spirit. Those are those two unchangeable things by which God, when he swore by himself, he was enacting and making it based upon because those are unchangeable. Is that what you want me to say? Something like that. Amen. So that was great. So what this does is this provides a cocoon, a place of refuge to be changed, uh, to be sustained. And so when God speaks... We can use this idea of Melchizedek Christian Church. Melchizedek Christian Church will be a place where believers will grow up and be kings and priests. This idea will grow into maturity. This is one of the promises corporately he's given us. He's giving us individual promises, but this corporate promise is here for us that we've been patiently waiting. So in this idea, we step into this cocoon to metamorphosize. You remember the butterfly, right? from class and I mean it metamorphoses it changes into an image and the image it's going to change into is the perfect image of God because that's its destiny it's calling and so what it does is it's a structure where God has created this place of refuge around you so you have his word and his spirit creating a place of refuge where in that place your idea is to grab hold of the hope that is there So it's a cocoon that you can grab hold of the hope, which Jesus is, the hope, Jesus Christ, according to the order of Melchizedek, to see, to comprehend, to grasp. And we'll get into this later, but where does Jesus do? He steps into the Holy of Holies because in the Holy of Holies, you step into the throne of God, into the dance with the Father, into oneness, And as you are changed and metamorphosis, metamorphosize, you are going to step out at a certain time back into manifesting that promise, whatever it is. So you see it with Abraham. He steps out. God calls him out. Boom. God, you are the word and you're giving your Holy Spirit as an oath, as a pledge. I'm going to live here in this place. 
And so when my wife laughs at me, when I think of myself too old, when I think of all the people around me, you know, people are doing all bad, when Lot's going crazy, I'm going to remain in this place of refuge, and I'm going to get to know you because I am an heir of promise. So time goes on, time goes on, he's learning, he's engaging with God, and boom, it, now comes the time he goes into his wife, and there, therefore being thought dead, he's able to bring forth the heir of promise because he's been changed he's partaking of this new resurrected life remember the idea of Hebrews is the resurrected son of God this is the end result that God is wanting us to manifest. This is what he's doing. And so verse 19, it says, enters within the veil where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. God himself is your refuge. And you're in that point of refuge, in that plane of struggle, of weakness, of suffering, of waiting for the promise. It is the perfect place to engage the hope who enters into the Holy of Holies, Jesus Christ, forever according to them, and get to know God and know yourself in oneness. So when you step out, you can give that perfect fruit that brings forth a blessing from verse 7. Daniel. So, take a breath. We're talking about mature things here. It's a little hard. It's a little hard to grasp this, okay? Don't feel like you're alone in thinking, man, this is a little tough stuff. This is really good stuff. But it's good for you to be in this place. As Josh was saying, this refuge, this place of the word and the spirit and having faith and being patient. Because you're, as you're in this refuge, you are being transformed. You are being changed. You are being metamorphosed because of what God is doing. And so what he's saying here is that in maturity... When you walk as a mature person, as we continue to go forward, and God desires for us to go forward, God has done incredible things. He's given us those two unchangeable things, his word and his spirit, and he's given us a hope that holds us within the veil. There is a hope that holds us within the veil. But here's the thing. Have you ever seen a moth or a butterfly get out of its cocoon too soon? I haven't, but you know what happens if they do, right? They ain't very happy. They ain't matured. They might have one wing, but they don't have two wings. <laughs> or they're probably going to get eaten. That's the reality of our life. When we think that God is calling us out of the refuge he's creating, he said, hey, be patient. We step out and we got one wing because we haven't been fully transformed yet. I know that's a crazy example, but... Sometimes you need a little craziness to understand maturity. So as a mature person, you recognize that there's an importance in staying in the refuge of the word and the spirit that God has given you. Okay? And as you stay in that place, God is transforming you. There is stuff happening inside of you that you may not even be aware of that God is changing. The men of old, the, the roll call of faith, look at all of their lives. They all went through times where they had to be patient and have faith. And in those times, they were changed and transformed. And in those times where they did patiently wait, they were able to maintain this reality where they were held by the anchor of their soul, which is really the hope. The reality, the hope of the fullness of what God has for us. You are a son of God. When God calls you a son of God, he's not going to let you fall short, right? It says right here in verse 17, desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose interposed with an oath. What is God's purpose that we learned about in Hebrews? Sons of glory. His purpose is to bring many sons to glory. That's you. That is you. That is me. His purpose is not going to be changed. His purpose is not going to be changed. His purpose is not going to be changed. If you want to know what God's doing, I can give you the answer. Always. He's bringing you to glory. 
He's bringing you to glory. Are you paying attention to what he's doing? Are you paying attention to the faith and to the patience that you're supposed to be resting in? Are you believing that while you're in this refuge and you may feel like a refugee, that God is doing something beyond what you can see? He's doing something in unseen realms. And when he brings you into the fulfillment of the promise, you're going to be a new creation. You're going to be a full person. You're going to have wholeness. You're going to have purpose in its fullness. You're not going to be one-legged. You're not going to be one-armed. You're not just going to be a half or a part. You're going to be whole and you're going to be full and you're going to be one with God. The reality of Hebrews is oneness, is oneness, is oneness with Jesus Christ who has gone before us. He is the forerunner. It just be one with Jesus. You don't have to understand everything about him. Just be one with him. Go hang around him. Spend time with him talk to him whatever you got to do take your clothes off make a scene whatever you got to do just be with him he'll know what to do just be with him he'll know what to do if you're bleeding out bleed on him if you're screaming scream at him he'll know how to handle you because he's perfect and he's the high priest and he is a man We are a man and we should follow the man. Jesus is the man. And where Jesus has gone, we will go because he will bring us there. He will bring us there. Have faith. Have patience. Carry yourself in a manner of maturity where it's not all about you. It's about what God is doing. It's about God's kingdom because his kingdom and his purpose in bringing you as a son to glory will not just change you. It will change your family. It will change your business. It will change the ground upon which you stand. It will change the city in which you live. It will change the nation in which you live. It will change the earth upon which you live. It will change the space and the dimensions that you desire to look into. His purpose in bringing you as a son to glory is serious. It's about fullness. It's about maturity. Don't get bogged down in everything has to hang on me. Don't get bogged down in it's all about me and my little situation here. Have faith. Have patience. Realize that God's at work. When you're changing your child's diaper, when you're taking care of a kid... If all you did was focus on that diaper, you'd be miserable. But you realize, hey, just stay still there, little son. Stay still, little daughter. I've got to change something. I've got to put something new on you. And they're sitting there squirming and doing all their crazy stuff, peeing on you, and you're trying to change their diaper. And all you're doing is just stay still for one minute. Hold still. It's going to be okay. I know it's wild and crazy right now. I know you feel naked. I know you're crying. I know you don't like how you feel. But let me put some new clothes on you. Let me do something new for you. Let me clean you up. Just stay here. Don't try to climb out of the little crib. Right? Just stay put for a moment. Have faith. Have patience. Because in that place of refuge, you are engaging with God himself. Jesus, fully man, fully God. Oneness with him. Once again, the same thing we've been talking about the whole time in Hebrews. Oneness. 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 I call you brethren. I call you brethren because we're one. We share in flesh and blood. Stay in that place of oneness. Stay in that place where Jesus has brought you within the veil. And the anchor of hope is going to hold your soul there. You may think you're going to drift away. You may think you're going to be pushed by the storm and by the wind and by the seas. But God is bigger than the storm and the seas. God is bigger than the things you think you can't control. He can control them. He can can speak to him he can do whatever needs to be done but stay 
in the place where you are one with God, one with Jesus, in faith, in patience, in the vessel of inheritance, because what God's got coming for you is some better stuff. It's some better stuff. Go ahead, bro. I, that's all. I just got one more point before we wrap up and pray, but that's all I got. That's all you got, but you got one more point? Yeah, it's just a then conclusion. that's not all you got. It's just concluding point. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> notice at the beginning of the chapter, it's Christ, but here it's Jesus. Yeah. Daniel talks about how Christ came to save you, but Jesus came, came with us to bring salvation through him. It's the man stepping into God. That's so good. It's the man Mm. stepping into God. And this is why it's according to the order of Melchizedek. If you remember Dr. O, Melchizedek is the man priesthood. It is man's priesthood. And so man had to step into God to become like him. This is Jesus. It's not Jesus the Christ. It's not the Lord Jesus Christ right here. What he's enunciating, what he's trying to get us to understand is that being purely man, he stepped in because he learned, he saw, he stepped in with his father. He participated with what God was doing as a man. You can too. In that play for his refuge, remember from chapter 5, God can identify with your sins. He can identify with your weakness. He's obligated to help you out. Fling yourself upon him. This reality and faith and patience, it's active. It's experiential. Force his hand in your weakness. Use your weakness. God, I don't have life. Why don't I have life? I mean, that's a fundamental thing. I should not have, not have life. Why don't I have life? Don't go 24 hours without life unless God is telling you you're going to starve for 24 hours. And which I doubt he's going to say to you. For real, be weak. Call somebody. Call God first and then call somebody. Don't go without life. Foundational principle. Don't sit there and strain. Just God, where are you? Step in. Allow God to bring this order of Melchizedek from within and manifest it without. On the without, on outside. I said that right, right? Yeah. Amen. The last point. Go ahead. Is it's about the big picture. Don't get caught in the small. The whole point of Hebrews is maturity, is fullness. Fullness is so much greater than what we see in just one place. Fullness is about fullness. Y'all know what fullness is, right? Fullness is fullness. God does fullness, and then he does better than fullness because he says the cup's going to overflow. So we're going to have some full fullness going into more fullness, okay? But it's about that big picture. Zoom out a little bit. Zoom out a little bit. Zoom out a little bit. God's doing a lot of stuff in our lives. God is doing incredible things in our midst. Every single one of you are an incredible person person every single one of you have a purpose that is beyond what you can see right now at the moment God intends to bring you as a son to glory amen so pray I wanna, we're gonna pray we're gonna pray for you but I want to just run through this idea of how it works practically how this idea of of the refuge and how you step in this reality of the high priest. Okay, so we've been Melchizedek Christian Church for 10 years, right? Eight years. Okay, but I've been a part of the church for 10 years. Okay, we've never grown more than about 20 people tops. And I have flesh. I have flesh because sometimes I get pissed off because I'm sitting there, God, it's been 10 years. It's been 10 years I've been doing this. I've been ministering to people. They come and go. I don't really care, blah, blah, blah. You know, I can get all the fleshy stuff out there. Regardless, God's try, trying me, testing me. Is it about me? So today I'm sitting here in worship, and this idea is coming back up within myself, within my heart. God, what is going on? There's no life. Well, it's, there was life. There was life. There 
There was life. But within myself, there was no life. I, it was just like, it was dry. It was hard. It was like, God, where's life? And he said, he just reminded me, what are you teaching on? Enter into the refuge. So what I did is I just spoke to myself just quietly. God, I believe in this word that we will be a group of believers who will be kings and priests on the earth. This is my reality. And I just positioned my heart in this promise. And you can do it with your individual promises. You can do it with your corporate promises. But position yourself within that promise. And God, focus him on the high priest. So I just focused on Jesus. Jesus, high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. In this place of refuge to pull me in, to start bringing me into the holy of holies where the throne is, where there's no sadness, where there's no tear, where there's no whatever. And you, it's not you're just standing there hard, but you're finding strength in your weakness. So that's what I want, us, want you to do and practice this week as, as I pray for you. And I think Brother Daniel's going to pray for you. If you want, as I pray, you can practice that because I know a lot of y'all are going through a lot of crap in your lives, both family, work, self, I mean, we're going through a lot of stuff. I mean, the whole world's going through a lot of stuff, or at least Tennessee is, Nashville is, a bunch of crazy stuff. Both sides, division, everything's going just absolutely bonkers. And God is saying, find myself in this place of refuge. Find my word. Dwell on it. Chew on it. Enter into this place. So let me pray for you. If you already have something, amen. If you don't, then you can just enter into this general idea God, my promise is to be a son to glory, to be a king and a priest in the earth. That's what we quote every communion. King and priest in the earth, not just when I die and go to heaven, but I mean right now, I want to be a king and priest. This is the promise. This is what you're doing, God. All right. Father God, we thank you. We give you praise and glory. We give thank you for your hosts that help. We give thank you for the just men that are made perfect. Uh, With us, Lord God, we give you praise and glory for Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But we just humble ourselves and we ask that you teach us faith and patience. And those who have been in this place of faith and patience, really let us understand this place of refuge. That it's not a place of scarcity, but really it's a place of abundance. It's a place of overflowing because there you're able to bring us into the Holy of Holies, Lord God. So we just position our hearts in this place of promise of your word, of who you are in Jesus, in Jesus. And I know you interpose that you, you, you lay over us, you imbue us, you cover us, you baptize us with the Holy Spirit, this oath, this pledge that you will bring it. And we recognize it and we recognize Jesus, high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And we believe that we can step in and then eventually come out and shine as the stars of heaven. In Jesus' name. Lord, I just agree. And we thank you, Lord, that it, it doesn't all have to be about us. We thank you that you desire to bring us to the fullness of being sons and being glorified by you, Lord God bringing many sons to glory. We thank you for that purpose, that you are bringing it about. Lord God, we just repent of any place where we have been immature. We just acknowledge it. We don't beat ourselves up, but we just ask, Lord God, that you would help us to go on, that you would permit us to go on as we focus on you, as we continue to be aware and believe and to practice our senses in those unseen realms. Lord God, we thank you that there are incredible things you've called us to. There is so much better that you have called us to. We desire to partake of the better, to know the better, and to know of the fullness of the reality of our hope, the fullness of the reality of Jesus Christ in the order of Melchizedek. We engage, we step in by faith, by faith, by faith, and by patience, and patience, and patience. We thank you that we will, and we are receiving an inheritance from God, most high creator of heaven and earth. And he will deliver our enemies 
into our hand. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you have any uh, questions, feel free to always ask us. If you get stuck in the middle of the week, call us. Yes, go ahead. Amen. I just put myself in a place of weakness and I focus my heart and my mind into believing this, that God, it's not about me. It's about you. I fling myself upon you. You carry my burdens. You are my faith. That was in, in Galatians. It says we walk by the faith of the son of God. And so your faith is upon God himself. This is this idea. This, you, you're, I constantly just speak it over myself as I train. If I start seeing something crazy, this is this idea. I'm just, I have this idea within my heart. God, I don't want it just to be about me, to be about myself, to have this vain imagination for myself. I want it to be about you. I make it about you for your glory, for your will. I recognize that my sins have been forgiven because when you start getting to that unseen place and unfortunately America doesn't deal with their subconscious that well, those unseen places within themselves. And so a lot of times those first things that you'll hit are usually something related to the accuser of the brethren or something from your past that will start coming up. And God wants you to deal with them, and you need to know what these things are, these basis are. Hey, I've been separated from the world. I've been separated from this, from that. I can put on, I have people who really care about me, who are with me as a community, who have spoken destiny in my life. So this is this reality that I meditate on.